Hello, and welcome to Virox Technologies' Ask an Expert webinar. Virox is the creator of accelerated hydrogen peroxide, which is often chosen in times of outbreak or in daily use for its unparalleled combination of safety and efficacy. Our products are available around the world in a variety of industries, both animal and human. Because regardless of what field you work in, disinfection is important to keep you and everyone in your facility safe. Today, we have invited professionals from a, from a variety of industries to come together and have your questions answered about infection prevention by one of our resident experts, Nicole Kenny. Nicole is the Vice President of Technical and Professional Services at Virox. As a relative of Florence Nightingale, it's no surprise that Nicole is passionate about infection control and was even named one of infection control today's who's who of the infection prevention industry. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for uh, organizing this. Oh, my pleasure. Well, we asked for your questions on infection prevention and you all delivered. So let's just jump right into them. So let's get started with a bit of background about Virox. Nicole, can you elaborate on accelerated hydrogen peroxide, the product family, and the role it's played in COVID-19? Sure. And I think um, just let me just set the stage when we're talking about COVID-19 today. It's, it's, you know, as a pandemic, as a new virus, there is going to be a ton of different things happening. Um, we know that there's been updates almost daily in terms of how the virus is spreading, what we should be doing from an infection control perspective, should we be wearing masks all the time, all of that. So some of the questions and things that did come in is a little difficult because there's so much science that we don't yet know in terms of of the actual or the full spread. So I think, you know, right now COVID, we're gonna focus it as a respiratory virus, that it's droplet, that it's touching hands, touching our face, and we'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, in terms of Virox and our accelerated hydrogen peroxide technologies, well, we really started dealing with SARS, um, the first SARS back in 2003. And that's actually when I started um, with the company. And that would be the first time we saw a novel coronavirus uh, impact, uh, become zoonotic and transfer from uh, animals to humans. Um, the difference with what we're seeing for COVID now is um, in part because we have so much more activity on social media. And so there's so much sharing and that's really causing a lot of the panic. Um, but what we're doing from an AHP perspective is, is being highly effective for viruses. Um, then the Health Canada and the United States, the EPA has what's called an emerging pathogens rule. And when a new virus comes in, if products have been tested against specific harder to kill or a hierarchy of viruses, then um, the products can be uh, recommended for use against a new emerging virus like like COVID-19. So that's really kind of where we've been. And a lot of what we're doing right now is just trying to help people understand that, you know, yes, we have a new virus, but it really, we need to focus on the infection control measures or the biosecurity measures that we've always used in our facilities. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, but maybe we want to talk a little bit about the uh, susceptibility of hierarchy, because I think that is certainly an area, particularly with this new virus, that, um, that's been a concern. So what Lara's popped up here is um, a pyramid. And in essence, when we're looking at disinfectants, and certainly, you know, today is, is the focus on COVID, but if we're looking at, you know, for any future or the use of your, uh, within your cleaning and disinfecting programs, it's to think about this. Um, and the hierarchy goes from the easiest to kill up to the more difficult to kill viruses or um, bacterial pathogens. And so envelope viruses, um, things like coronavirus, influenza virus, um, HIV, hepatitis, they are actually among the easier to kill uh, viruses um, and easiest to kill organisms. We then move up to vegetative bacteria. Um, so things like staphylococcus, uh, salmonella. And when I say salmonella, um, I'm going to classify that as an entire family. So think of it as, yes, there's there's several types of salmonella strains, but from uh, an infection control perspective or from a microbiology perspective, what we see is once you're able to show that you can kill one strain of um, bacteria or one strain of a virus, um, you are able to kill uh, 
other strains within that same family. So salmonella, where we have, um, you know, ones that affect humans only, affect pigs, affect everything, then as long as we have one active uh, claim from that microbiology perspective, then we would be expected to kill everything else. Now, this is contra to what the EPA um, indicates where their stance is you have to have everything on a product label. Um, but that's also where we get into issues with increased cost of products because there's a, there's a, a cost associated with all of that testing. Um, and so I really look at it from my background in microbiology is that if the product has, a, has one, at least one, maybe even two uh, claims against the same organism, you're going to be effective. The same thing would be for staphylococcus or uh, looking at resistant versus uh, antimicrobial resistant versus susceptible um, strains. Then if we move up into the non-envelope virus, disease we're talking to parvovirus is a great example in, in this. And it's something that certainly in the animal world, uh, canine parvo is probably the most prevalent or asked question. Um, but there are uh, mouse parvoviruses. There are all sorts of, there's a parvoviruses that impact cat and slap cheek um, or B19 is a parvovirus that kids get. So that's a very difficult to kill. And that's actually one of the standards or surrogates that's often used to determine efficacy against emerging um, pathogens. And so again, if your product has a claim against canine parvovirus, then the expectation is that it's effective against other parvoviruses as long as you're using the right solution. Um, microbacteria or TB, uh, certainly that can be a concern. It's less about TB for transmission for humans. Um, because that is an airborne transmitted disease, so you can't get it from touching surfaces. Um, but there are other microbacteria that can cause uh, issues within uh, personal services that are water uh, loving, born type things and can cause skin ulcers and there's infections within the animal health world as well. Then we get into protozoa, um, which are very difficult to kill. There are not uh, claims associated uh, with those. So typically these would be like uh, things like Giardia or crypto. And so we're focusing on removal and cleaning and the physical cleaning of the environment. And then bacterial spores, something like uh, Clostridium difficile that we see in healthcare that causes uh, horrible diarrhea. Um, so those would be kind of our hierarchy. And that's how I would look at it from a disinfectant perspective. Contemplate, do I have claims in the appropriate uh, levels that I'm looking at for my facility and, and not really get hung up on terms of comparing, well, this product has 100 claims and, and product B only has 23. But if you start counting 10 different staphylococcus claims, that's really not, you know, 100 claims that you have. You're, you've got one. So that's my focus anyways. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for clarifying that one, Nicole. So another question that came in quite a bit was about how soon after wiping down a surface, is it okay for someone to come into contact with that surface again? So could you mm. elaborate a bit more on contact time? Sure, premature evacuation, if we will. <laughs> um, that's a coin, and I know it's a little cheeky, but uh, it's something that we talked about uh, as a company uh, a number of years ago, where we kind of came up with the idea of really having to understand contact time. Um, so I'll focus on contact time first, and then we'll talk to what needs to happen from touching surfaces. So. Um, when we're looking at uh, contact time, all products that are on the market have a specific length of time, contact time, that the surface has to stay wet in order to achieve the disinfection claims as per the product label. So I know I never read um, a product label. I don't know if you ever read a product label before working at Virox. And <laughs> many, <laughs> it's horrible. But many of us don't understand that, that our the contact time for some products is 10 minutes. And what that means is the surface has to stay wet for 10 minutes in order to achieve the contact time. In healthcare, um, where it, contact time really became important was part because we'd have joint um, health and safety or the joint commissions group coming in with a stop clock, monitoring and measuring the housekeeping staff to see if they were actually achieving uh, the contact time on their product. And, and what we see is when we don't have the contact time and it dries before, you're not getting the level of kill. And so it's important that when we're looking at a surface that we've cleaned, 
um, and we've disinfected is that you want to allow the surface to stay wet for the contact time. And if it's, if it's one minute, well then once that one minute has, um, has elapsed, if there's still solution on the surface, you can either allow it to air dry or you can wipe it dry once you've achieved that contact time and then you're safe to touch that surface. If it's a 10 minute product, um, then you're gonna have to generally wipe multiple times and you wanna keep applying until you get that full 10 minute contact time before you consider the surface disinfected. If we're gonna follow absolute, you know, to the letter of the T of what our product label um, is. And I don't know, maybe if we wanna show that a video that we've got that discussion that talks about contact time. Absolutely. And so, it is loaded uh, up here. <laughs> It's not the greatest video, but it, what it does is give you an example between um, product A, which is uh, hydrogen peroxide, and product B, which is a quaternary ammonium uh, alcohol uh, combination wipe. Both, both products have the same amount of solution, so we're not fudging um, in terms of how we're making this demonstration. What you're seeing, product A has a one minute contact time, product B has a three minute contact time. And what we're seeing here is with the product, particularly because of the alcohol in there, it evaporates really readily. So it evaporated in about 23 seconds, which means to achieve the three minute contact time, you're gonna have to wipe it about six times. And that's a lot of product, it's a lot of wipes, it's a lot of time. And so that's really something to be contemplating when we're looking at that. Um, it's concerning when you see that visual. <laughs> I know. Well, this one's even worse if we look at what happens um, when we're not achieving contact time. Um, and so the next slide that Lara is going to throw up is uh, showing um, before and after um, uh, Petri plates. And so the middle row that you see with the huge amount of black, that is um, Petri plates that we took swabs from a hospital. I won't name the hospital, but it was before cleaning and disinfection. And so that just shows that over a 24 hour period, there is a lot of, you know, bacterial um, and, and bio burden built up. It's not to say that everything in that petri uh, dish is, is infectious. It's just to show that this is what happens over a period of time. Um, this, the petri dishes that are on the right hand side that you see, you know, a reduction in the amount of um, pathogens on the petri plate. It were surfaces that were cleaned with a quaternary ammonium product. And so they were wiped, um, allowed to air dry, and then the testing occurred. You see a reduction um, in the amount of pathogens or, or germs that were on that surface, but certainly there's still a, a significant amount. And the concern with that is if it's bacteria, um, many bacteria uh, have the ability to really rapidly reproduce. So um, depending on the bacteria, depends on the speed. But, you know, in some cases, one bacteria over a period of five to eight hours can replicate into a million bacteria. And then that's where we get these, these surface transmission uh, issues. The Petri plate on the left is showing what the surface was after AHP was used. Um, and so this was a, a clinical study. Uh, two facilities, we did uh, blinded applications, but when, um, when the researchers were swabbing, this is what they were seeing their before and after and showing the differences of the importance of contact time um, in order to achieve disinfection. So one question we did get was about how many wipes do you need to make sure mm. that you have contact time? So yeah. when using AHP, is it safe to say that one wipe should do the trick, but when you're using another product, you might need to use multiple wipes. That's correct. And then you also need to look at the size of the surface. And so it's really looking at, um, with your wipe, uh, how large of an area are you cleaning? And it's really visible. And this is why I actually like the disposable wipes versus cotton or, um, and I, I detest the use of paper towels, but that's a whole different conversation. But when you're using a pre-moistened wipe, um, they are actually designed to release liquid and they will dry. So you start seeing that when you start, you have a nice wet surface and it's even distribution. You're getting the physical friction. So you're picking things up as well. Um, and the longer you go, the larger the space, the less solution. And 
that's really where it's important to start changing. So if you're doing, um, you know, many wipes, you can do you know, your typical exam table and one wipe would be sufficient. Um, but that one wipe wouldn't be something you're going to then use on the entire room, your stethoscope or things like that. And, and it's really looking at when the surface starts getting dry, when you're using your wipe, you want to uh, get a new one. Right. And we do talk a lot about cleaning and disinfection. And we had some questions come in about pre-cleaning organic materials. So can you elaborate on when pre-cleaning is required and what that looks like? Mm -hmm. um, another great question. And these are all really, it, it's interesting because when we're, when we're reading um, product labels, it, it can be confusing and there's different test methods that we do with that. So um, Typically, if we're looking at infection control guidelines, then best practices are cleaning to make certain that the surface is free of any visible soil. So if we're dealing with blood, body fluids, you know, feces, if we're dealing with animals, um, uh, nail particles, if we're, you know, at a professional beauty and having a manicure or a pedicure, all of those need to be removed. So if you're seeing dirt on a surface, you really want to physically clean that first. Um, generally, you can use uh, some of your products will be cleaner disinfectants. And if you're using a cleaner disinfectant, um, if you understand that your product has a detergent in it, so think of soap like we're washing our dishes, then that soap helps pick up the soil. So you've kind of done your first wipe, the surface is clean, and then you would apply um, the, the disinfectant or you would use your same product uh, to disinfect. If um, the products are one step disinfectants and you're looking at your surface and there really isn't any um, large visual amount of soil on there, then a one step cleaner disinfectant allows you to simply do your disinfection and cleaning in one step, assuming we're getting our contact time. Well, then let's get into the disinfection portion. Because <laughs> as you can imagine, there are a lot of questions coming in about that. So do you have any tips for the best practices when it comes to disinfection? Mm. Training, um, definitely. Uh, I think really, you know, there's there's focusing on just the wiping, but maybe um, if we want to step back and really talk about kind of how we build out an infection control program for cleaning and disinfection. And this is something that I know that we talk to a lot, um, different markets, depending on the facilities and the facility type, we might reduce the number of steps. Um, but in many of our, you know, what I would call healthcare, whether we're dealing with um, massage or uh, personal services, um, if we're dealing with veterinary facilities and things like that, I kind of indicate that there's seven different steps, particularly if we have staff involved and it's not just a, a single owner operation. Um, so first of all, depending on your facility, you've got to determine who's responsible for what. Um, you know, if you're not told you're responsible for something, you're not going to do it. And you're assuming somebody else is going to do it. So, you know, that includes at home, who's responsible for taking out the garbage? Well, at work, it's who's responsible for cleaning and disinfecting in your area and who's doing, you know, what um, perhaps somebody's going to focus on floors, somebody's going to focus, you know, elsewhere. Um, so really making certain that that's clear and everybody knows what their role is. That's one of the most important things. The reason why I bring that up is I have seen in hospitals where unfortunately we haven't had that discussion and that's actually been a cause for outbreaks or continued transmission um, because people were assuming somebody else um, was doing it and, and I have an example of that with commodes um, and some people have heard me tell the story over and over but you know a commode is a toilet and but a commode is on wheels and so it moves around. And in a situation with one hospital, well, it, in a C. diff patient room, it hadn't been cleaned for seven days. And when the facility brought the nursing staff and the housekeeping staff together, they were pointing fingers at each other and they're like, well, it's a toilet. So it's housekeeping's responsibility and housekeeping's like, no, it's on wheels, it's portable, it's nursing's responsibility. And, and that's really important. So really it's who's responsible for what, making certain everybody's aware. Um, depending on the facility, there could be different levels of risk. So um, if we're dealing with a veterinary office, then, you know, where uh, 
the animals are coming in um, might be different than the kennel, which would be different than the exam room. Similarly, at um, at a you know at a at a spa, uh, the area where people are coming in, the exam room, a bathroom, there would be different areas, and so then you can determine what needs to be cleaned or what needs to be disinfected. And certainly in this time of age, because of COVID-19, we really want to hit on all the high touch surfaces. So if your hands or your clients or your patient's hands are touching it, you want to make certain that that's being frequently cleaned. And I would say at least two times a day, if not more. Um, depending again on the facility, what are we dealing with with transmission? Um, some bacteria or viruses are transmitted from touching surfaces. Others are from coming in contact with respiratory droplets where, you know, you get in the face. And that's why we're being recommended now to wear masks to keep our moist talking to ourselves. Um, and then with that, once you have an idea of your pathogens and how they're transmitted, you're going to pick your disinfectant make certain that the claims are appropriate and that it can be used in the way that you want to um, and do the training. Um, that's really important because every product has differences in contact time, in dilution rates, in shelf life. Um, and so shelf life, I mean, if you're using a concentrated product and you dilute it into a spray bottle or an open container, how long does it last? Some last within, you know, have to be disposed of within 24 hours. Others you can use for 90 days. Um, and so that's important because if you're using a product that's expired, um, you're not going to be killing things. And again, there's been situations uh, with outbreaks that, you know, the, the root cause was uh, a product that had been diluted and kept under a, uh, a shelf for, you know, who knows how long and they brought it out. Um, make sure it's accessible. If you have it locked up or it's not convenient, people aren't going to go out of their way to get it. Um, and so we see that with hand, hand hygiene. I know here at Virox, we put up hand sanitizing stations throughout so that people can easily grab them as opposed to, oh, I've got to walk down the hall before I can, you know, sanitize my hands. So making certain that you've got easy access to your disinfectants and your hand sanitizing capabilities. Um, and then your quality control. Um, if you are a facility that has tools or equipment that you're soaking, um, like uh, manicure uh, tools we use for manicure and pedicures, you need to make certain that you're testing those or you're disposing of them properly. If it's a concentrate, we're using an automated dilution system. You want to make certain that you have a way of testing to make certain it's working. Think of your dilution system like a car. It needs its lube oil filled for preventative maintenance. If we're not doing that, it can break, and that can lead to a disastrous outcome. And there so that's are, kind of that's kind sorry. of it in a nutshell in terms of how I would set up disinfection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But with so many different types of tools and equipment, especially with people from so many different industries on here, like makeup brushes and collars mm -hmm. and leads and laundry, where should people be really focusing their efforts? <laughs> Ah, uh, that's a great question. And right now, I mean, certainly we're thinking about things that we never thought of before. Um, so, you know, again, when we're setting up our policies and I've talked about high touch surfaces, um, really be contemplating, you know, pretend that you are um, your client or your patient or, you know, depending on your facility and when they come in, what might they touch? And so I would look at that from a high touch surface and really thinking, okay, where are people's hands going? Um, because when they come in that door, um, you don't know what they've touched. We don't know what's on our hands. I know, um, you know, I've been lucky. I've been able to get back to my hairstylist. And the first thing they have, they actually lock and they open the door for us and they walk us right over to a sink so that we can wash our hands with soap and water. Um, so anything that we touched previously coming into their facility is washed off our hands. And so those are the things that we want to be contemplating. Um, and then you want to look at the type of surface. So a smooth surface, like a countertop, a door handle, um, it's going to transfer easier than, say, a textured surface like upholstery or um, a bathrobe or things like that, uh, linens that would be on top of um, a massage table, as an example, or towels that we might use for, for animals. And so what we have here is actually a picture of, you know, me having fun with a little bit of finger paint and trying to give the idea of what happens if we're touching surfaces. And so the top purse, the top picture has a sponge. And when I flipped it over onto a piece of paper and pressed it, you can see that while it had lots of, of um, 
paint on it, it's absorbed in and it's not actually transferring onto that surface. So if I'm touching that, it means it's not transferring to my hands as easily as, as say the bottom, which is a tile where it's a smooth surface, lots of paint on it. And as soon as I put that over, that paint automatically went on to the paper. And so again, it's that idea of the smooth surfaces. Uh, that's where I would focus. We're really looking at smooth surfaces. We're looking at high touch areas, um, you know, where we can get the hands. Now, if we're dealing with animals, then the floor becomes, or if we're dealing with children, then the floor can become uh, something that we need to contemplate a little more readily. Um, and again, that comes to making certain that we're picking up dirt, that we're sweeping, and that, you know, that we are um, cleaning the floor routinely uh, to make certain that there really isn't anything there that could transmit when we have those types of, whether it's children or, or animals that are experiencing their area, their area in a different way. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to disinfection, we have had <laughs> we've had a lot of people asking a lot of questions and exploring a lot of different avenues to pursue for disinfection. So one question that we have had is, can you compare and contrast the pros and cons of solution based disinfectants versus a UVC light? Mm -hmm. um, so for UVC uh, versus disinfection, and there's lots of different application tools and things that are out there. So, you know, um, the first thing to remember is if we're using UVC or anything else, um, we still need to clean. So you can't just bring in a UV machine and hope that it's going to kill everything um, because it has to have a direct line of sight and the surfaces have to be cleaned previously. So if somebody's thinking to use UVC as opposed to needing to clean the area, you can't. It, it, in the UVC machines do specify that you need to at least clean um, and wipe down all the surfaces before you're going to disinfect. So there's, you're not reducing. Um, the UVC machines, they might give an added benefit, but there is a time and a cost to those um, and you still have to clean. And, and I mean, I've seen some success in hospitals. Um, particularly when we're concerned with hospital acquired infections, but I would really be conscious as to where we might use those outside of healthcare um, because we, you might spend a significant amount of money, but not really get anything in return because you're still going to have to have manpower for cleaning. Um, yeah. So I would kind of talk to that if we want to get right into a whole bunch of different, um, uh, you know, the different applications. Um, then, you know, again, we have, um, electrostatic sprayers, there's fogging, uh, power washing. Um, but again, with any of those, we still need to be looking at how we're handling. So electrostatic spraying, um, or fogging, there still is a cleaning aspect. If there's soils in the area, you have to remove it, um, in order to allow the disinfectants to work. Um, power spraying uh, is great in terms of dirty surfaces, helping to facilitate removing soils and getting um, products on the surface. But if we're dealing with some airborne pathogens, then we want to be careful because that pressure can actually aerosolize them and have the potential to spread. Just depends on on what we're doing. Um, but I do believe that you know larger areas where we have to clean walls and ceilings. Um, the ability to apply a product by spray, particularly if we can foam it, you see where the product's being applied. So you can reduce the amount of chemical you're using and you can reduce the amount of time it takes uh, to clean those areas. Well, we'll come back to that. But one hot topic right now is mm -hmm. protective equipment. As we know, that's very important. So can you elaborate on what our users should be wearing to keep themselves safe and can they rewear this equipment? Uh, <laughs> great question. Um, I actually brought my, I didn't bring gloves, but um, here's a picture. I'm a hockey mom. Um, and uh, this is a picture of friends of mine, uh, their, their children from this morning, um, going to the first hockey um, practice and their siblings. And so when we're talking social distancing, even though they're siblings and live together, they were told to separate. Now it's a boy and a girl, maybe that was the reason. Um, but you know, in this environment, we need to be contemplating what we're doing. So 
the first thing right now for COVID, we're wearing a mask. So, whoops, let me take my glasses off because it's a little bit easier. So we have our mask. And you want to make certain that the mask is covering our nose and that it's covering our, um, our chin. And depending on the mask, there may be, um, mine's a washable one, so I don't, but sometimes there's a, a metal thing here so that you can bend and make certain that, um, uh, that you get a bit of a seal. Um, now, what I am hating and what I'm seeing when we're all out is everybody's touching this. It slides down or people are walking around like this because it's hard, you know, it's harder to breathe or you're breathing warm air. We need to consider that this is dirty. And so you, you want to keep your hands off of this space. You don't want to be um, really touching um, because you have to pretend that this is contaminated. When you take them off, you want to take them by the loop. And I'm going to be knocking off my, uh, my earbuds here. Um, but you want to take them off that way. And when you have earrings, it's a little bit hard too. Um, now you want to consider your hands dirty and you want to wash your hands. So for us, it is about wearing masks. If I'm going to be in a facility, um, the, you know, most masks, like what I'm having, or I do have some of the disposable blue masks, for the most part, uh, you can wear them uh, until they're moist. Once they're moist, you need to re you need to change them out. Um, it's going to become harder uh, for you to breathe, but it's also, you're not really trapping anything. Um, and then you're either gonna launder them or dispose of them. Um, when we wear an N95 mask, which is what uh, hospitals are having and some nurses that are going in to work with the COVID-19 patients, it is a protective respirator that really ties on. Um, there is some ability uh, to be able to reprocess those with, a, with appropriate measures. And it's not just like a spray and wipe. There actually is a process where we're using equipment. Um, so for the most part, I would utilize uh, either disposable masks, at which point I would dispose between clients. Um, and even I would even look at the uh, the face mask. The more I'm breathing, the warmer they are for the the cloth ones. You want to be replacing those ones quite frequently. Um, when it gets into our hands, um, for ourselves that are practicing, you know, medicine or or providing personal services, then we want to contemplate the use of gloves because we we need to be conscious with our hands. Um, for the general public outside, I don't believe that we need to use gloves. We're not trained how to take them off. And we often think of them as a protection mechanism. But if anybody's been driving, seeing people drive with gloves on, they're touching their hair, they're pushing their eyes back, they're in you know, their glasses back, they're on their, their cell phone. Well, what have you touched? And whatever you've touched with your gloves, you you're just touching everything else. And so I am really for that aspect, I think we're better off uh, not wearing gloves in public, and that we're using hand sanitizer or washing our hands um, quite frequently. Um, and then, you know, again, if we're depending on what we're doing, you know, some areas we might want to wear um, a, a smock or something like that. Not that we have issues for most areas, but if you're, again, seeing lots of clients, um, if you're doing manicures or pedicures, the ability to have something, you know, um, covering your lap when the foot's there so that you're not wetting, you know, your clothes aren't getting wet or things like that. You might want to contemplate um, that. But for the most part, really the mask is really important. We want to make certain that we're uh, keeping our moist stuff together. Um, and in that uh, we're not in, inhaling anything. And that's really why, you know, why the importance of, of the masks and where we're seeing the improvement in transmission um, because our respiratory droplets just aren't getting out there. And uh, if they're not out in the environment, they're not on a surface, our hands can't touch them and we can't uh, transmit them. Um, I think we had a slide actually that kind of talked about um, some of the transmission. Yeah, this one. And so, um, you know, across the top, I've just got some areas we've talked a little bit in terms of, you know, there's the respiratory droplets. When we talk, when we yell, when we sing, it's like, you know, stuff comes out. Um, and that's really what the masks are protecting us from. Um, you know, 
I hate to say we're not allowed to, you know, to hug anybody or shake hands these days. Um, we've had one of our colleagues get married and all of us are having to do air hugs. We can't even, you know, we're not even hugging her because we're trying to keep our distance. Um, but that's because the second picture is showing like we don't know what, what's on people's hands. And, you know, unless you're going to say, hey, can you go shower or wash your hands before you come near me? Um, which we should be if we're going to a healthcare provider. Um, we do need to think that our hands are dirty. Um, and then if we're sharing things, uh, whether it's a cell phone or, or things like that, like, I mean, I don't, I don't clean my cell phone every day. That's mm -hmm. disgusting. I understand that, but I don't, but those are the things that we're touching we're sharing that again, those are surfaces that we need to be contemplating cleaning, um, of course, as well as any equipment we're using, whether it's stethoscopes or uh, nippers and clippers or barbering tools, you know, depending on the type of facility we're in. Um, I think we see a lot of people wearing, you know, kind of almost in this protective bubble um, idea, which is, you know, where I'd put that picture in. But it's really the idea of being conscious. Um, what we're doing now is not new. Um, you know, most of our facilities, the people that are online with us, they understand infection control practices. The difference is it's actually the general public that is having an awakening and understanding better how things are being transmitted. And so for me, it's an opportunity that us as, pro as professionals can educate and kind of remove some of that fear, but also talk to what we're doing. Um, I can't stress hand hygiene enough. Um, you know, it is really just constantly wash your hands, um, use soap and water whenever you can. Hand, hand, you know, hand sanitizers are great, um, but I, you know, I still prefer the soap and water. Um, if we're using masks, you know, or disinfectants, don't wear them like my son does. It's not for their face. It's like wear things properly, use them properly. Um, and the last picture is just really thinking about our T-zone. And this is where when we're wearing a mask and we're moving things, well, you know, you might be touching your eyes or moving your glasses up or you feel the steaming. And, and those are the things that, that um, probably more of us are hyper aware of now what we're touching and, and we really want to keep away from our face. And so those are some of the things, again, that we can, you know, talk to people while they're coming in for, you know, whether it's a pet visit or whether it's, um, you know, a massage or, or what have you. Uh, we can do a little education. Um, not even just for what we're doing, but for what they can do to, you know, protect themselves when they're out. Well, speaking of protective equipment, there are some professions where social distancing can be pretty difficult. So mm -hmm. it's not enough for one person to be wearing protective equipment, such as a mask or a face shield, or does everyone in the confined space need to be wearing protective equipment? So that's a really good question. And, and this is one that's hard because it's certainly if anybody sees um, you know, the news where we're seeing different politicians, you know, wear or not wear masks. We see the public being really, you know, it should be my choice uh, whether I need to wear a mask or not. Um, there's been some good, uh, good pictures. And, and I think really if we can visualize it, it's that idea that from a mask, um, particularly with, with any of our clients, what we're trying to do is stop what's coming out of their mouth or nose from getting into our, our environment. So if we can, if we look at the top picture here and you're thinking that every time somebody opens their mouth, stuff is coming out. And that's true, stuff is coming out. Um, so if they're in a mask and I'm in a mask, then we're stopping what's coming out, which then limits our ability. Um, I think we need to be mindful that not everybody can wear a mask. So, you know, um, I think we should have the ability to say, you know, our establishment, our policies, whatever our um, governing bodies are stating that you have to wear a mask and this is what we're required to follow. Then I think that allows you to have a strong stance to say when your clients or your customers come in through the door, I need you to do this and here's the reason why. Um, and I think that's kind of really important so that you as a professional can, you know, be confident in why you're recommending it. And I do think in those confined spaces, then masks are important. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know, if we look at the veterinary uh, world in particular, or even, um, you know, some of our friends and family that have lost people during COVID, it's, it's that end of life and what can we do? Um, so I think if we're in a veterinary facility, and there is an end of life um, 
because of a, because of a sick pet, then I think it's a matter of I would recommend, you know, that we're both wearing masks. I mean, you know, we're caring individuals. Um, I think, you know, you can set things up in a way that you can make it as comfortable as possible, allow them to be near their animal, um, perhaps you know, have things prepared ahead of time so they can kind of step back so that, um, you know, the appropriate um, medical assistance is allowed to be there. Um, but I would have, I would have masks and then, you know, maybe, um, you know, step back and allow the family uh, to have their, their moment. Um, when we're dealing with, um, you know, personal services, I know that we can have, you know, basically most facial type uh, procedures we're not allowed I desperately and I think let many women um, need an eyebrow wax um, and I don't quite understand if I'm gonna wear a mask why you can't do my eyes um, but that said if I'm if I'm laying down and you're over top of me um, and yes we're both wearing masks you know maybe there's still a chance that my eyes are you know are unprotected and I can get something and so I think we just have to really remember that respiratory droplets um, you know hit surfaces, hit our face, and, you know, be extra careful right now in terms of how we're, how we're keeping ourselves distant. Um, and it's not just for, you know, your protection, but it's, it's helping when we have a client that's really resistant, it's, it's about their protection as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. And I know we're hearing those questions a lot as well. Mm -hmm. I've been a lot of ladies saying, when can I get my eyebrows done? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. Uh, there are also concerns about returning home and after a long day close and how to keep your family safe. So do you have any recommendations on steps people should be taking before re-entering their home? Mm -hmm. um, and this is really, I mean, for myself, um, it's all about hand hygiene. I, I'm not, uh, now, if I was a nurse and I was working in a hospital, I would definitely right now, I think what, what recommendations are is that your scrubs are staying at the hospital. We're not wearing them because there is that chance that that could be, um, uh, you know, contamination. And so, you know, definitely in sort of any procedural where I'm working close with a patient or a client, um, I might have clothes that I, have at work um, that I remove and you know I have clothes that I'm wearing home um, I'm not worried about my footwear and the first thing I do when I walk in the door as soon as I put my stuff down is wash my hands um, and so really I think if you're washing your hands and you have hand sanitizer close to door as you're leaving and you sanitize where you're kind of removing things um, before and if you're washing your hands when you get home for the most part that's really going to be um, as effective and then and then it's being it's being mindful if I'm going to go shopping I wear a mask um, you know so again I'm trying to be thoughtful of what I might be picking up I uh, wash my hands a lot when I'm grocery shopping I have hand sanitizer right in my car. So as soon as I open my door, I sanitize my hands before I touch anything else. Um, and so those are some of the measures that I do in order to um, protect myself. But really it's, 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 I'm more concerned about my hands and what I do with them than, than my clothes or anything else. And then of course, keeping away from people and keeping my stuff to myself with my mask. That's my biggest challenge too, is keeping the hands away from the face. I think we yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, another hot topic is travel. So when traveling, what kinds of infection can people expect to run into when they travel? And how can you prevent infections on the plane, on the bus, or a coach mm -hmm. as a driver or as a passenger? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I was actually talking to somebody about this uh, a couple of days ago. So, I mean, there have been a number of studies over the years done about how dirty um, surfaces on planes are, um, you know, all over the place. And again, you know, I think I think what COVID-19 is doing is opening everybody's eyes to understand that, you know, we really interact with the environment and how does that impact um, us. And so again, when I'm out, if I'm taking, you know, when we were traveling a lot, we were in, you know, hotels, we were in taxis or Ubers and, and certainly planes, trains and automobiles. Um, it still for me comes down to my hands. And so I'm um, conscious of, you know, the, the bins. So if you're going through uh, airport security, those gray bins, um, 
I'm quite certain that they would never get cleaned and would be really disgusting. There'll be bacteria. There's probably, um, you know, there'll definitely be viruses on there. Heck, there's probably feces and all sorts of other stuff on there. So it's a matter of wash your hands. Um, and even if I'm getting onto a plane, um, I carry uh, wipes with me. Um, and it doesn't always have to be disinfectant wipes. I, that's what I utilize. Um, but, uh, you know, so when I sit down in my space, I wipe um, my hand or my armrest. I, I pull down the, um, uh, the tray. I clean all of that. Um, I don't typically watch TV, but I would, if that's a touchscreen, I would, you know, clean that entire area as well. And it's really about just kind of keeping yourself um, clean uh, in your environment, clean, washing your hands before you eat. So again, thinking about how many different people have been on a plane when you're coming and sitting down and they're going to serve you snacks. Well, don't just immediately start eating. Have hand sanitizer in your bag, sanitize your hands before, uh, before you eat anything. And that's really what I try to do because most infections when we're traveled, yes, there's going to be some respiratory uh, things like cold or influenza flu that we might pick up. A lot of what happens is actually our ingestion, the hand mouth type reaction of what's there and what we're touching. So if we keep our hands clean, I think, you know, that'll, that'll help. But, um, you know, getting sick is not great. Um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes we do. It's, you know, coughing into our elbow, um, washing our hands after, um, uh, you know, we've blown our nose, uh, after we've gone to the washroom. Um, and if there's a questionable seatmate beside you, it's, you know, maybe we don't shake hands and, you know, offer them a tissue. Well, speaking of keeping our hands clean, with the recent shortage in hand sanitizer, we've been getting... <laughs> a lot of questions about if you can use AHP on yourself instead of a hand mm -hmm. sanitizer. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, so uh, the truth is from a safety perspective um, that accelerated hydrogen peroxide is uh, non-toxic um, to eyes and skin and hands, uh, non-sensitizing. So uh, we can. And I think, I mean, I know I do, um, and I have, um, but it is a surface disinfectant. So it's designed, it's designed for use on surfaces. So as a company and from a registration perspective, um, it's not something that we can recommend or license. But, and again, because of the safety, we don't need to wear personal protective equipment. So, um, you know, if somebody has used it in a pinch or they're, cleaning something without, uh, without uh, the, you know, wearing gloves, it's really not a concern from a safety perspective. Um, but uh, certainly proper hand sanitizers and, and soap and water is what we should be doing. Yeah. Well, for those who can get their hands on some hand sanitizer, some recommend applying it and rubbing it in and others recommend applying it, just letting it air dry. So which is the correct way? <laughs> um, most, if you actually read the instructions, and, and uh, the problem is if we're using the little bottles, there's really not a lot of information there. Um, but the physical friction, the rubbing, and because if you just put it on, like hand, hand hygiene, um, most of us, if we were to do um, UV and see what we haven't touched, our thumbs are certainly areas and our fingertips. So proper hand hygiene, you're putting it in, you're actually um, making certain that you're doing this um, with your fingertips. And when you're rubbing that you're you're rubbing up on your hands and your thumbs like this as well. So it's really is that importance of putting enough on your hands, rubbing it around, really rubbing, rubbing, sorry, like, you know, you're kind of doing the front and the back and you're trying to get the product in. So the more you're rubbing, then you're getting the contact time. That's how I've found with most uh, products that that is the recommended um, use. As opposed because it's too, it's too great if your hands are wet. Um, you're going to touch something. And so that that rubbing helps get the contact time and is similar to washing with soap and water. It's not instantaneous. It's, it's you know, tw uh, you know, 10 to 30 seconds, depending on the product. You need to make certain that, you know, you're getting the contact time. Well, let's go back to using HP on yourself because <laughs> people are concerned that pets could be a, a mm. COVID-19. So another hot topic is, can we use AHP on our pets? Yes. I mean, that kind of goes back to the beginning where 
you know, with COVID-19, we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And and there's going to be constant. So I know early on in um, the outbreak in China, there had been the identification of a dog um, that did seem to have tested positive for COVID. There's been a couple cats associated. There's been some mink associated with it. And so, um, you know, that really has been a, a discussion. I think you know, from a veterinary epidemiology perspective, when I've talked with some of our, our um, experts in that aspect, it's the animals, like a cat might be able to become sick, but we're not seeing transmission um, to human. So, you know, again, could somebody have sneezed on your dog or your cat and you're petting and you're touching? Um, I guess theoretically there could be, but there hasn't been any proof that it's happened. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying we don't want to not think about it, um, but I think I would focus on other areas um, rather than being concerned. Now, if I step back and say I am a um, a person who's responsible for uh, you know our first responders or our our nurses and I'm taking their dogs in and have a doggy daycare looking after you have all these different people and they are in potentially high risk uh, jobs certainly then I would contemplate what I'm doing and some of the things that I would put in place would be if I'm having an animal come in I would um, you know assuming I know how many animals I can handle on a daily basis I might contemplate having my own collar and my own leash for them so their collar and their leash that they use at home is left there and the one that I have I know is clean and disinfected so there's less chance of any transmission because the collar and the leash particularly if it's uh, both kind of like the nylon type they're going to be more difficult to clean um, so I would then say okay for my extra protection it doesn't cost me that much to have these and I might do that um, and I'm going to be asking you know when your animal is being dropped off you want to be conscious is there any respiratory uh, issues at home you know, are they feeling okay? So that um, not just the animal, but the people so that you're not also having the potential of, of the owner dropping off when they're sick. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, I know some people have been using the wipes to wipe down. Um, again, it comes to me, it's hand hygiene. Like I think if I am petting, uh, you know, I grew up on a farm, my mom was a nurse, we pet the dog and then you wash their hands. And I think it's really kind of just being conscious um, at the very least, always wash your hands before you touch your face and wash your hands before you eat. That's that's really going to help us. Well, could we go back to the safety profile of AHP? And is it safe to spray it around people and animals such as birds? Mm, that's a good question. So um, I know we had a slide on safety. We had it up, but we didn't really talk about it. So maybe we can go back to that one. Um, for AHP, again, I touched base. Uh, it is considered, or we've done appropriate testing, that it is uh, non-toxic by oral, respiratory, uh, dermal uh, contact. It's non-irritating to eyes and skin. Um, so, you know, generally speaking, uh, people can be um, can be sensitive to uh, different chemicals or different disinfectants. Um, but for the most, uh, you know, people can come in direct contact with it. And it's not um, a, a skin, uh, it's not sensitizing so that it doesn't actually, you know, cause repeated issues. Um, and so from that type of a safety perspective, you know, it's fine. Um, we have done a lot of work um, that toxicity also transmits over to the, the safety profile around animals. So if a dog or a cat were to lick a surface um, where a uh, you know, AHP has been used, then we're not going to run into an issue from a toxicity perspective. There are issues with other chemicals where it creates ulcers in their in their mouth. Um, and we do have uh, our product used widely uh, in bird sanctuaries as well as different raptor centers. So um, on product labels, it often specifies uh, not to be used around uh, uh, birds and wildlife or, or uh, aquatic uh, animals. And that's a requirement from the EPA. Um, but certainly uh, with the accelerated hydrogen peroxide products, we do have them. Um, I know the turtle sanctuary uses it. Um, I've been into the um, raptor center in, um, 
in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, and they use it there around their training, their both their educational birds, but their birds that they are rehabilitating. Um, so we do know that it's safe in that aspect. Now, with any area, um, you're going to remove the animal. You're not going to spray with the animal in there. And so um, it's either, I know with some of the, the new cages, um, for cats where we have the ability to have the two different sides, you can kind of have them on one side, clean the area, let them go to their other side through their portal and then clean that area or a dog you're going to remove from their kennel. Um, and the birds would be the same thing. You're going to generally remove them, clean the area and then allow them to come back in. Um, but uh, it is safe. Yeah. And then this is just an example here in terms of just the overall uh, concern and things we need to be talking about with chemicals in general. Um, the, the one uh, scary thing that I found through COVID is just the increased use of chemicals. And um, in both Canada and the U.S., calls to poison control have more than doubled and they're doubling month over month. Um, because of consumers who are spraying and using products everywhere and they don't need to. Um, this is just a summary slide that talks to a couple of uh, studies. One was done by the CDC looking at the impact of chemicals and disinfectants on eye, skin, uh, respiratory sensitivities, um, as well as, you know, dizziness or, or headaches. And what they found was over the course of um, five years in four states, uh, almost $45 million in occupational health and safety complaints um, were uh, were contributed to the cost of using chemicals. And so, again, it comes back to um, choosing products that are safe, using products safely and again that training aspect to make certain that all of our staff or our volunteers um, if it's a shelter an animal shelter that the volunteers understand how to use them as well so we're not um, mixing things we're not you know thinking that we know how to make a better chemical than what was chosen for the facility that's very good advice and uh, we talked on this we touched on this a little bit earlier but i would love to go back to it uh, because a lot of people are finding that this spring is getting quite tedious and there are questions about applications. So can you elaborate a bit more on fogging, electrostatic spraying? Or mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it, it really comes down to the size of your facility and, and your facility type. Um, so electrostatic spraying is something that's really become popular during COVID because especially if we're thinking buses or ambulances. Um, you know, we've seen it a lot in uh, buildings when everybody was closing down. And so building services, the owners of the companies were coming in and trying to. And so we look at electrostatic spraying. Um, it's basically a machine that um, has the ability to uh, atomize and and apply with, with a charge, uh, a disinfectant. Um, and so you can reduce the amount of disinfectant that you need. Um, but again, you still need to clean surfaces if there's any uh, soil there. So you need to make certain that because when you're just spraying, there isn't any physical removal. So if it's a dirty area, you're going to have to clean, like say a dog kennel is an example, you're going to have to clean any feces or urine that's or dirt that they've tracked in that's on the floor before you can apply. Um, but if you have a relatively clean space, like a office building, um, then that becomes something that you can then walk around and spray. Um, but you do need to make certain that the products are intended for that use. The EPA is actually cracking down um, on using disinfectants in electrostatic sprayers without appropriate testing. They've finally determined what we can do to test and prove efficacy, um, but that's because there hadn't been. Fogging the same way. Um, not every chemical can be used in a fogging device. Fogging typically was a con uh, a process that was used as an adjunct or used after cleaning and disinfection happened. And so again, um, there is that cleaning aspect. But if we're dealing with a large space where we have a fogging machine, um, you can. Uh, but again, you have to make certain of the products designed to be used in um, because uh, some foggers have a heat component. There's different uh, droplet sizes and that can actually impact efficacy. So it's making certain that we're marrying the product with the process and that it's being done um, as effectively as possible. Um, when it comes to pressure sprayers, I actually, or even there's pump up foamers, um, 
There are uh, some other really cool portable foaming equipment um, that can be done. And I quite like that for larger spaces, but as long as these spaces have drains. So again, if we're looking at cleaning surfaces or cleaning spaces, if you are what I would call a dry facility in that there's no drain and you're putting a ton of solution, which has water, what are you going to do with that? Because you don't want puddles um, left around that can be slippery and can run into issues. If you have a drain ability, then yeah, um, using some of these pump up foamers or a pressure washer is a great way. You can, again, reduce the product you want to apply bottom up. So that you're you're seeing the foam and think of it kind of like in that S pattern, working your way from um, bottom to top. And then when you're rinsing, you go top to bottom. Um, and those can really reduce the amount of time the foam clings to the surface and you're getting your contact time. So you're going to be achieving disinfection. Well, well now as we're talking about application, are there any surfaces that the product cannot be applied to, such as wood or furnishing materials? Oh, the compatibility question. Yes. Um, every chemical has its advantages and disadvantages and concerns with different uh, uh, different surfaces. So one thing that's the equivalent for all uh, chemicals is the idea of untreated wood. So if we're dealing with two by fours or things like that, um, that you do need to be conscious of how you're applying products. Not that it's a compatibility issue. It's more of an efficacy issue from the EPA. Um, with AHP, we've done a lot of uh, compatibility testing, um, not just on surfaces like laminates and countertops, um, but also on medical devices. So we've worked with companies that have dialysis machines and blood pressure cuffs and things like that. Um, so we are quite effective uh, and safe on virtually uh, most surfaces. What I don't recommend or what we would generally not recommend prolonged exposure would be with copper and brass softer metals. Um, oxidizing chemicals like hydrogen peroxide and um, bleach will have an impact on that. Accelerated hydrogen peroxide is really uh, compatible with stainless steel and other metals. So we do have an advantage over bleach in that aspect. Um, and then the other thing I would contemplate is some clear, um, uh, clear plastics um, we would want to be conscious with. And remember, we're a disinfectant, not a glass cleaner. So if you're seeing streaks on things, that's because there is soap. Um, and we wouldn't ever use dish soap to clean our windows. And so there's some, you know, areas that have reflective surfaces we would want to um, either buff or rinse off so that you don't see the streaks. But for the most part, when we're going into facilities on cement, um, you know, our products are used widely on cruise ships. So when we're dealing with the opulent surfaces in cruise ships, um, you know, if it's a treated, what we call treated wood, so it has a urethane on it, you know, we're compatible there. We're compatible on all of um, uh, you know, elevator buttons, things like that. Uh, and then when we're used, oh, we're actually used on the uh, space station. Um, AHP is actually the only disinfectant um, that's been approved by uh, used to be uh, uh, used up on the International Space Station. And that took two years of compatibility testing. So I guess if we're going to talk about the importance of, of safety from surfaces, but also the safety um, from an occupational perspective, because you're in an enclosed area, then that's probably the best way of, of really being able to highlight the fact that AHP can be used in multiple areas on multiple surfaces with, uh, you know, very little concern. Mm -hmm. Well, the next question, you've actually alluded to this already, but how has misuse of various disinfectants, such as fluorines, clots, Etc. impacted our ability to manage infections in 2020 and beyond? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, there's, there's a couple different plays. And so I think there are, um, you know, and I think, yeah, this is a perfect slide where I call it the disinfectant dichotomy, where, um, you know, when we're using chemicals and, and we're using buckets of solution, when we dump it down the drain, you know, sometimes we don't think about what happens after it's been dumped and really what what where it goes eventually back into our, our environment. So um, we do know from history that there are chemicals, disinfectants that had been used that have um, adverse impacts on the environment because 
their uh, chemical doesn't break down and it, it, it builds up or accumulates um, and then can cause issues from an environmental perspective. Hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen. So we don't have that issue. It doesn't lead to um, uh, chemical resistance or antibacterial resistance because we're not leaving it active on the surface um, or in the environment once it's disposed of. Um, and then what we also need to think about is from that, that claims perspective. And so over time, uh, as chemicals, there are improvements from an environmental perspective, but when we want to kill um, more organisms or we want faster contact times, basically what we're having to do is maybe give up the environmental or the safety profile in order for a product to kill uh, more or kill faster. And so it's really, you know, we have to remember that we're killing things when we're using a disinfectant. Um, but it does come down to looking at the chemical, what's left behind, looking at the uh, the legacy chemicals. So triclosan, as an example, is a phenol um, type compound. It's widely used in, uh, was used widely in hand sanitizing, um, antimicrobial uh, skin prep. Uh, if you ever used Colgate Total, the original one, it actually had triclosan in the toothpaste. Um, and what we're finding now is that it, many phenols are uh, considered carcinogens. Many uh, guidelines actually don't recommend the use of phenols around children. And triclosan itself is being banned in many of the states because of both the impact on our health, but also on the environment and what it's doing there. Um, and so it is looking at the different chemicals and really, you know, Again, it's not just price, um, it's not just how fast it kills or what it kills, but it's being holistic with your choice and you know, choosing products that if you're dumping them down the drain, how is that going to impact the environment because that impacts our future. Um, so looking at products that uh, either have um, you know, some merit through the EPA with their surfactants uh, so that they are more environmentally friendly surfactants, uh, hydrogen peroxide, citric acid, are two uh, active ingredients that are uh, safer for the environment. Um, and so really kind of choosing products around that aspect. Mm -hmm. Well, not only disinfectants are a topic, but we're also a little extra conscious about air quality. So mm -hmm. is maximum ventilation desirable even in cool weather? That is a really good question. So I kind of look at, when it comes to ventilation, it's, it's about your air exchanges and it also is about how you're applying the product. So if you are in a closed space and you know, you're know you using um, a, a sprayer, um, what you can look at changing is moving to a foaming trigger because what rather than atomizing or aerosolizing your chemical, um, moving to a foaming product reduces that air quality. And so, um, you know, really, it's not that you have to increase anything. It, it's looking at perhaps we change how we're applying um, the products uh, to improve the air quality. Um, also looking at what those chemicals are. So if you're a facility that's using a lot of isopropyl alcohol, uh, as an example, that's going to impact your air quality um, and can lead to, you know, issues with, with staff and or patients, depending on the type of facility you're in. Mm -hmm. And our next question is regarding professions that treat people for ailments that could resemble symptoms of illness. For example, massage therapists who like who treat people with muscle aches. So what do you recommend as extra precautions when screening incoming clients? Um, so I think if we're, you know, if I'm looking at what most of the recommendations are for coming out of different public health, um, applications really you know we are focusing on temperature uh, so uh, the difference between a cold or aller seasonal allergies when somebody might have you know a bit of a cough or runny nose uh, is that uh, with COVID or influenza something like that they're going to run a fever and so you're looking at a temperature of 38 degrees celsius or above um, and that's really one of the things but if you're in a warm uh, environment also take consideration just because somebody's come in and you do their temperature um, that you know are they hot because of the environment but really you, you know you're going to ask about um, their temperature and you can do that temperature you can ask you know how do they have any uh, uh, family members or people that they've been in close contact that 
have um, been exposed to somebody with COVID that's been confirmed with COVID or have they themselves been tested positive for COVID recently and how recently? Um, those are some of the questions. So most people are having, having a questionnaire and that they are then, you know, keeping record of who's in, that they've responded to the questionnaire um, so that they're protecting themselves in that aspect. And then immediately thereafter, have their hands washed have access to hand sanitizer. It's really, you know, hand sanitizer and wearing a mask. Well, that's great advice. And our very last question that will <laughs> conclude this webinar is, how do I leverage my skills and knowledge as a wellness consultant to provide consulting in infection prevention? Oh, that's a great question. And good on that person for looking to broaden their horizon. Um, I think really, you know, if, if you've got some background, um, you know, and it takes a while, you can certainly utilize, uh, build relationships with infection control practitioners or public health uh, um, people within, within the facility. But it's really, you know, taking that understanding and how you can help is just, you know, don't sensationalize things, but be calm and provide sound stage advice. So, you know, if we're talking about, you know, how do we protect ourselves coming in and uh, into our house or things to do? Well, we don't need to be cleaning every piece of groceries before we come in. It really is, you know, we reinforce whether it's Health Canada, the CDC, or the particular uh, um, public health area within the city or state or province, reinforce what they're recommending. And they are our experts. And so it's making certain that people understand how to clean their hands. Uh, how to properly disinfect, you know, what to be concerned with and not not to be concerned with, and really not trying to scare people. So really, anybody that wants to get into infection control, part of it is being that calm person that can help reduce anxiety, reduce stress, um, and be able to message, message things simply um, and show people where you're getting your advice from is really important. Well, that is that concludes our webinar today. So thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you to everyone for tuning in and sending in all of your great questions. We did our best to get to everybody's questions today, but if there is still more information that you're looking for, please visit myrocks.com. You can reach out to our customer service team. They would be happy to give you some mm -hmm. more answers. So on behalf of Virox and our presenter today, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for organizing this, Laura, and I hope we answered the questions. <laughs>